you doing, everybody? And welcome to Wisconsin Sports on the Go with Trage. I'm your host, Trage. We're back. It's Friday. Austin's back. Rogan's gone. It's kind of like the old days now. I got the finger guns before we started, a little bit of everything. So Austin had a day off yesterday. A lot happened yesterday. A lot happened this week in Wisconsin. I feel like I missed a lot, Trage. I missed a lot. You did. You did. We're going to get into it today yet, though. We're going to get you involved in some of that talk. So Austin, how are we doing on this Friday? It's finally Friday. Hey, I couldn't be more excited. My first week of uh, college and the second semester is over. So um, only, what, how many more? Six, no, no. 14 more weeks left to go of my junior year in college. Who's and uh, it's Who's going got? pretty fast, Trage. It's going pretty fast. It yeah, is. It, it, it really is. It, we're at the end of January already. We're getting closer and closer to Major League Baseball being back, which I'm glad for, because when the Packers are out of the playoffs – I run out of stuff, you know. I got I got the Bucks and the Badgers, but like, where's that other shabam? Where's that, that other train. thing? I was I was walking home from class, and you know, it's it's a little rainy down here in Lacrosse, but like a lot of the snow's melting. And I'm like, man, you know, I could use some Brewers baseball right now. Actually, you know, I was it feels I'm not like a, it. I'm not a big Brewers like I like I watch the Brewers, but you know, they're on Valley Sports and everything, so I'm like, ah. I'm not paying whatever how much money's for a month to watch them, but like when they're on, I'll watch them. And I'm like, yeah, just a little nostalgia came over me. I'm like, man, you know, I can't wait till them summer nights when the Brewers are playing on the West Coast. It's like nine o'clock at night, and they're probably gonna get the they're probably gonna get the crap kicked out of them by the Dodgers because they got Shohei and all that. But I'm like, you know, those were some good times staying up late at night watching them games up till twelve. You know, that was the worst days at the start of the podcast, though, because, you know, as people know, we like to talk as if we're the day of. Right. But we got we got Austin's got school. I have a job. We can't shoot during the day. This isn't our day job like a lot of other podcasts. So we do it like late in the night, the day before. So we don't miss a lot. We got all the daily news and everything like that. And those nights where we have West Coast baseball. I would, you know, this is the early days before Austin was even involved yet in the podcast. He didn't get in until about the Brewers were already done in yep. the postseason. And it was like towards probably around the when they were playing the Diamondbacks that first wild card weekend there. Yeah, right around there. Right after you interviewed, he had an interview on the show here. And then I just asked him, I said, hey, how would you feel like about coming on? And he came on to the show. And since then, everything's gone great. And those nights, though. I mean, I would stay up. It'd be 9 o'clock at night. And I, I'd wake up for work 5.30, 5, 5.30 in the morning, get to work 6, 6.30, somewhere in there, depending on what we're doing. And I would stay up until midnight, whenever that game got done. And then I would shoot my podcast. That way I didn't miss anything with the Brewers. I could rant all night, whatever it was. Holy crap. I mean, that was something. And it was worth it. It was well worth it to where we are today. But son of a gun, you know, you, the the – the amount you put in, it's the amount you put in. And I've had fun. I've had fun. But holy cats, those West you know, Coast baseball games. Yeah. And we and we learn now that if the game gets too late, we just say, you know what? Next day we can talk about it. You know, we'll talk about it tomorrow. There's going to be more games where, where uh, especially basketball with the Bucks and everything, there's going to be more games down the line. If it's a football game, it's a little bit different. They only play, what, 17 games and then some in the playoffs. Yep, so those yep. kind of want to get out, but. I mean, these games where they play 100-something games, it's like, ah, eh, you can go to the next one. I'm sure it'll be either the same or a different result. You know, it's going to be relatively the same. I know. And in the playoffs here for the Packers, I that when they had the divisional round and they hadn't released the bracket yet, I was praying for Saturday night. Just because then Sunday we had the whole day to shoot a podcast. We didn't care when we were going to start. We already had the Packers news in there. So we didn't have to wait until the late game on Sunday until after that to shoot because Monday morning, we got to get back up for work. So it has definitely been a ride to talk about here on the show, but you know, yeah, I mean the weather right now, I just, I don't know what to think. We get a lot of I snow. I feel something in the air, Trage. I feel something in the air, you know, there's just something in the air. I don't know what we it is. Snow. We get snow. Then it's frigid cold. Now it's back up to 30s. Next week, they're talking 50s again. And then I'm it's worried it's going to dip change. back down for – it's the global warming. I told it's you different. I told you earlier when we weren't getting snow for Christmas, it's global warming. Snowed for two weeks. And now If we would all buy electric to, cars, if everybody would just buy an electric car, we'd be fine already. But change no, our, no. Pledge, our pledge to the podcasters are we are going carbon, carbon neutral by tomorrow. 
Is that how that works? I don't know how that works. I got to drive my van, which uh, my my work van for my elect, you know, electrician. Um, I got to drive that into work, and it is gas. Um, I will not be uh, carbon free by tomorrow. I well, at least this podcast that. will be carbon neutral by tomorrow. We will not use any gas powered vehicles uh, or generators to run this show. We will not oh, use yeah. any of it. We will use electric power from our outlets, which, well, we're not going to get into all that, but we all we're doing our part. Well. So that's all that matters. <laughs> it's all, it's all that matters. It's all that matters. So getting into it today, we got a lot to talk about today. We got, uh, Anthony Rendon was in the news talking about something in baseball. I just want to tap into what he had commented there on a different show. Also, we got the Bucks in. They were in action against the Cavs and going to be in action again here uh, against the Cavs coming up here next. Also looking at the Badgers in action against Michigan State. Marquette rolling in against Seton Hall. And then we're going to see where the day takes us. Lots to talk about here in Wisconsin sports on this Friday. So right away, Anthony Rendon was on the Jack Vita show. I'm not sure who Jack Vita is. I have never heard of the guy in my life. Never heard of him. But. Never heard of him. Never heard of him. But Anthony Rendon said, we got to shorten the season, man. There's too many dang games, 162 games in 185 days or whatever. No, we got to shorten this bad boy up. I've never, I've thought, you know, they shortened up the pace of games or like they made them shorter and less time consuming. I've never thought about limiting the amount of games though. 162. I can't, Anthony Rendon can't even talk. If you were to look up his stats, he's injured for the past three seasons, hasn't really played. So I don't know who he is to talk. He played in probably 10 games in total. So his body isn't taxed at all. I just, I've never thought about shortening up a baseball season, I guess. I mean, yes, I guess sometimes it seems like it could run a little bit long, but I mean, that's baseball for you. That's it takes that long to figure it out. Well, and I'm just doing a little some calculations, some mathematical calculations here on my uh my phone here. And I was like, uh, what are the games for say a, a football season? So I was like, well, 17 times five, let's say. And I mean, that's at least 85 days, and that just counts. Monday through Friday. That doesn't even count the weekends. If you wanted to, I guess you could do seven times 17 there. 119. But yeah. then I'm like, well, you got to count preseason too because a lot of those players are also working their preseason. So 20 times seven there, 140. So we're still creeping up there. And then you also forget about uh, um, fall camp and all that stuff. Even before yep. then, football is a lot more physically demanding than baseball. And they're able to do that stuff. And I get, I get, I mean, baseball, you do a lot of traveling, huh? I mean, you play yeah, three yeah. games, stay in a hotel, and then maybe you get a day break, maybe, but then you're traveling on the next day or whatever. I can see that. But that's part of the deal. It's been, this has been part of baseball, 162 game, 162 game season. It's been part of baseball for who knows how long. And the fact that he wants to come in here and like say short, that's the problem with sports, Trage. A lot of a lot of players these days are like shorten the season. Football, they added a game, so yeah, that's the yeah. opposite. But basketball, it's a lot. It seems like a lot of players are like, oh, let's shorten the season, or I'm gonna sit out, or something like that. A lot of players are sitting out. I don't know. It's just I don't know why baseball does not seem overly, bro. Like you play, you play in the outfield, or you play in the field. How many times do you actually get the ball hit to you? Maybe, yep. maybe five times in the game. Maybe if you're a third base, it's even more rare, which I'm pretty sure Anthony Rendon plays. So, yep. uh, bro, you're literally just staying out there, and then you get what four at bats? Yeah, and you, I mean, bro, you're bare, like you're getting paid millions of dollars to. I get baseball is a hard sport, but dude. You're not even going to play all the 162 games because you're super old, anyways. Like, you're definitely going to be sitting out how many of those games. So, I don't know what you're complaining for, wanting to say, shorten up the season. I don't know if he's talking about the actual season or if he's talking about uh, spring training or what. But, I mean, come on, man. You're like, it's 
baseball, I feel like, is way more mental than physical, 100%. Oh, yeah, yeah. And you, like you said there, I mean, you look at, okay, 162 games. Yes, that's your season. But this is your day job. This is your job. Like you said, the key word there, millions of dollars to go to your job. I go to my job as an electrician, and I'm not going to say I don't make a decent wage. I really don't. You know, at the end of the day, plumbers make more than I do. Blue collar, trades, Blue collar. Blue collar. But I can't just say to my boss, well, you know, sir, honestly, I don't, I'm not going to be able to do math here to figure out what you would do to take out weekends and holidays and everything like that out of a year. But let's just say 270 some days, 275 days, whatever it adds up to be. I don't know. But. Hey, sir, I can't work two, you know, 275 days of work is a lot. I mean, could, could we like dial that back and maybe get 175, but yet hold on, hold on. I still get paid my full amount that I would if I worked those other hundred days, but like, you know, it's a lot, it's a lot on my body and everything like that. That's what he's telling me right now. That's what he's saying. My day job is too much, too many games. So can we dial it back just a little bit? I mean, are you kidding me? Are, are you serious right now? That is the thing that has always irritated me. You know, you said professional sports, and it's it's all over professional sports. It's not just baseball. It's basketball, like you said, players sitting out of games. Guys in the NFL, we haven't really seen it as much in the NFL yet, but I imagine there'll come a day where we'll see it. But, you know, you look at these guys, and it's like, okay, yes, I understand. You got to be away from your family. You're traveling, this and that. You can fly your family with you half the time. You make millions of dollars. You can probably buy another house in every city that you go to. You could probably make that happen if you really wanted to. Your family, if you look at, say, like Bryce Harper with his contract, or even look at Shoei Otani's contract now, what's he going to do with all that money in his life? His family set up for the next couple generations. And that's the thing with professional sports. Yes, the seasons can become long. That's what you do to be a professional athlete in whatever it is. Baseball, basketball, NFL, doesn't matter. You are putting your body out there on the line for entertainment of fans to get paid at the end of the day because that is the the career choice that you took in your life. You know, and for him to come out and say something like this, yeah, I get it. It can be grueling and it can be taxing and everything like that. But at the end of the day, man, it's a day job. It is a day job. And at some point, you got to suck it up and you just go back to work. That's how it works. You suck it up and you go to work the next day. I got to work tomorrow. You think I want to go to work on a Friday? No, no way I want to go to work on a Friday. But I'm going to. But I can't just ask my boss, hey, boss, you know, I just want to sit out today. I sit out too many days. I'm probably not going to have much of a job left anymore. That's the difference. Real world versus the sporting world. You in the sporting world, you aren't really held accountable to anything. You're not. And in the real world, you are. And that's what I think, like you said, is a problem in sports nowadays. Just expanding on that is that players have so much control over what goes on inside of an organization nowadays. Whereas in the past, you didn't play, you got cut. That's how it was. They didn't care who you were. You had to play to make your way. Nowadays, you don't have to play. You can just sit there. You can sit off to the side. Look at how many. I mean, the NFL is big for this. How many guys sit out of games because they don't want to get hurt or they want to be traded, so they sit out for the longest time and wait for that team to trade them. Jonathan Taylor was a prime example of that. He wanted a different contract, so he sat out of games. I just, you know, I. it's coming into college, too, with money being involved in college now, too, but it, it is a real mess with players having the amount of control that they do and are able to sit out of things just because they don't feel like it. They don't feel like it today, so they're just not going to play the game. That's, I mean, the problem with the NBA also, like you watch guys sitting out of games in the NBA, that was a big problem there too because, you know, you, they, I mean, the, the classic line is, what about a guy who gets paid – X amount of dollars, he wants to show up to this game to watch Giannis play. Giannis is sitting out that night because of load management. That's a problem. That is a big problem. And if you're an organization, you got to see that as a problem. And I think that's where uh, professional sports and even college sports are getting away from. And they're allowing players to have so much control over what they want to do. And you're, I mean, you're going to have control. That's your right to have control over yourself. But you got to be held accountable for that then too is where I'm getting with this. 
What I think is funny about this whole situation, especially this coming from Anthony Rendon, is I looked up his stats. Since he joined the Angels in 2020, he's only played above 50 games twice. So he played 52 in 2020, 58 in 2021, 47 in 2022, and then 43 in 2023. So you're telling me you want to shorten the season? Buddy, you're only playing maybe a fourth of the season already. What do you like, – That's I why mean, he wants just, to shorten the season. That's why he wants to shorten it. <laughs> like, bro, you're not even already playing all these games, so it doesn't even matter. And your stats are – I mean, through those games, subpar. Like, I mean, when he was on the Nationals – Grant, when he was on the Nationals, he played uh, – the most he played was 156 games there, which is pretty much a full season. But that was when he was how – that was back in 2016. That was almost eight years ago there. So yeah. a long time ago. And uh, he's a lot older now, I'm guessing. But his salary is $25.5 million in 2020, and you're only playing a quarter of a season, getting paid that much. And you want to complain about shortening the season already? Like, dude, if you don't want to play, then don't play. I like, just retire at that point, honestly, because no, yeah, that's you're not really adding a whole lot. You're not already you're already not adding a whole much value to your club already. But oh, exactly. I, I mean, know. it's it's ridiculous, and for a guy like him to come out and say it, a guy like you said who barely plays already. The only reason why he probably wants to shorten it is so those forty games that he plays, he's in all the games then. He played all 40 games of the season, so great. I mean, just ridiculous. I think it's ridiculous, and it's a problem. It's a problem in all the sports. And what's crazy is all most sometimes all 162 games will count. You look at when the Brewers played against the Cubs in 2018, was that? I mean, they went to game 163. So if yeah. you want to if you want to say that, yep, oh, yep. I mean, the odds that all these games will count. I mean, there's been times where it's been close and they've gone to game 163 to, de- to determine the division leader there. So, um, and baseball is one of those sports that, I mean, if you're off, you're off. But when you're like, if you're on your own, that's why they play so many games in the series when you get to the playoffs. Because, I mean, it's just things are so spotty depending on the pitcher and the lineup and everything. Uh, it makes sense why there's just so many games. Usually when you look at football, Whatever team is out there, the best team is usually going to win most of the time, unless you look at the Panthers this year and they somehow win two games. But, I mean, those are just odd ones out there. But most of the time, if you look at, say, the Ravens, they're probably going to win almost all their games just because they're the better team. Baseball, I feel like, is a completely different story, as uh, some teams will win um, two games out of a three-game series, and then the next time they play, they'll lose those two games out of a three-game series. Just based on who's playing and who's in the batting order, who's pitching, it's just baseball is a different, completely different sport, and uh, it makes sense why they play 162 games. But no, yeah, and that was exactly what I was going to say. There is that it takes that long to get guys in a groove. You look at injuries in a season. How many injuries happen throughout the season? There, you constantly have moving pieces trying to figure guys out, get rookies in there, whatever it is. It takes that amount of time to figure that kind of stuff out. So if you shorten up the season, that takes that much out of there. I mean, we shortened up the season in 2020 for COVID. How well did that go? That was terrible. That was all around terrible. I mean, teams didn't have a chance to even get going. And it was like, oh, we're already three quarters of the way through the year now. Um, I guess we're going into the playoffs. Brewers made the playoffs with a sub-500 record. They were below 500, I believe. And they made the playoffs. That's how bad a shortened season was. So... I don't see it. I really don't. I think Anthony Rendon is far off with his comments there of saying to shorten the season. But with that, I want to get into, we got the Bucks. Bucks coming up. They're going to be in action against the Cavs coming up this weekend. Also, they played the Cavs as of late. So right away, I'm going to jump to you, Austin. What did we see for stats in that last matchup against the Cavs that will kind of lead us into this next matchup? Yeah, I mean, it's kind of been the same guys that has always been there for the Cavs that when we played them last time, too. And what I was saying during the pre- preview show about this game, I mean, Mitchell's there with 23 points, Jerry Allen, 21 points, 12 rebounds, and then Struess had added 14 off the bench. Nang had 14, and Merrill had 12. But 
I mean, I think we, I think everyone that watches have watched have seen the Bucks this year, has seen um, maybe the coaching change was for the best decision. I mean, we held them to 116 points here with uh, without Adrian Griffin here, and this Cavaliers team is was on a roll. I guess you could say. I mean, they're a pretty hot team too. When you look at the uh, for the Bucks here, the stats for the Bucks: Giannis had 35. Lillard, 28 points, and Milton with 24. Not a whole lot of action off the bench. I mean, Portis had eight here, but uh, still contributed a little bit. But it was mainly those three guys. And this was overall, I mean, this is kind of what we've been wanting to see, holding a team, a hot team, to 160 te- or 116 points, which I feel like is very reasonable for a lot of teams these days to hold them to 100, 116 lat range. But then our offense didn't really slow down at all either. I mean, a lot of guys were hot shooting. It was good to see Middleton getting a lot of points there. Giannis added uh, 18 rebounds and 10 assists, so he had a triple-double. And uh, Joe Prutney, I mean, hats off to you, man, because you are pretty sure he's like I – don't, I don't think he's lost a game as a head coach. I think I saw that somewhere. He's like 4-0 and or something when he's been in as a head coach. So, I mean – I don't know why we're signing Doc Rivers here, but, uh, I mean, who knows? Doc Rivers is a pretty good coach too, but hats off to them for getting this win. And, I mean, next game, I think it's at the Bucks again because usually that's kind of we, – we were talking about this before. Weird schedule, weird, weird schedule that the NBA has put together here uh, that they're playing back-to-back games. And, uh, yeah, it will be at the Pfizer again. So, hopefully the same result. I don't know if Doc Rivers is going to be coaching this one yet or not, but – um, that'll be interesting to see. I would assume not yet. I would just assume I think it's going to take a week maybe to get him in there. I hope that this game wasn't the Bucks trying to spite what Adrian Griffin was doing because, I mean, they showed a little bit more fire in this one. And, you know, we saw it in the dancing before the game there, kind of a little bit more upbeat now that Adrian Griffin was gone. It's not a good look. It really isn't a good look on the Bucks. Yeah, I get it. They didn't. They had their problems with Adrian Griffin. Dame had his problems with Adrian Griffin. I'm guessing Giannis did too. So, right time to move on. But I just hope that you know this wasn't the Bucks coming out and just saying, "Well, look what we can do." And now that Adrian Griffin's gone, we can hold the team to 116. If you had that ability then or before. Why didn't she do it before? That's, you know, one of those kind of deals there with the Bucks. I'm just hoping that's not it and that this Bucks team with new leadership will start to trend in the right direction. My only worry is that Giannis, five new coaches since Giannis has come to the Bucks now. Budenholzer, we knew our, his faults with him. It just, it, do the players have the control here or is it the front office? That's what I want to know. Does Giannis have the utmost say in the Bucks organization right now, or is it the front office? Because back in the day, you got the coach you got, and that's how it was going to roll. I mean, they didn't care. Nowadays, it's like, well, you know, this player doesn't like the head coach, so let's get rid of him and let's hire somebody else. Yeah, I just That's what we were talking about earlier, earlier there with players' control over a team. It makes you wonder, who's got control over the Bucks right now? Is it Damon Giannis? Or is it the front office there? It, and it's interesting to point that out. Also, though, I mean, the GM and the assistant GM or whatever you want to call it, I mean, they showed up to a practice and saw yeah. what was going on too. So that also could have had a factor into whether or not to keep Adrian Griffin or not. Obviously, they saw what was happening on the court and how subpar defense was sometimes not existing. And then, they're, then they show up to a practice. So I don't know if that's – probably what had a lot to do with it. And then also yeah. the Giannis effect. I mean, Adrian Griffin's first year, Giannis, like you said, has been here for how long? I mean, at this point, this is Giannis's team, eh? it seems like. But uh, yeah, I don't know with Doc Rivers coming in. He's a little bit more old school here. Um, he's won a championship with Boston, and he's coached how many – he's coached how many um, high players in the league. So – Definitely going to be interesting um, to see how the coaching is different. I'm excited. I mean, I don't think we haven't had – I mean, obviously Coach Bud was a good coach, 
but I don't. We, it seems like we haven't had a coach like Doc Rivers before. You know, kind of like a higher name like this, who's been in the league for yep. forever. We had uh, Jason Kidd as a coach, and we saw how that went. Yeah. Not yep. very good. Um, and then, I mean, there's probably been how many coaches in the in the mix there since him. And then Coach Bud, who led us to a championship. Thank God. Um, that was an exciting time. But I mean, those times have passed now, and I saw something on. Instagram that when the Cavaliers won their championship, they were first in the East and they ended up firing one of their coach. And then they saw, or then they uh, hired Tyron Lou as their coach and yeah. ended up winning the championship. And then they're like, and then they had the guy, uh, picture of the bucks underneath that we were second in the East. And then we fired Adrian Griffin and then it was doc rivers. And then they're like, is this a year? Is this the championship year question mark or whatever? I don't know about that, but, uh, you know, I, I, th- I find it funny that, uh, um, obviously ESPN had something to say about it or whatnot and, um, always have to compare it to something, you know, they just always have to compare it to something and, um, it'll be interesting to say the least, um, how our defense changes and what the mindset is. You, like you said, they, uh, players seemed a lot more energetic now that Adrian Griffin was gone, which if I was Adrian Griffin, I'd be a little heartbroken honestly seeing that because it's like, why, where was this when I was a coach? Like I get that there was probably a little bit of struggles there, but I mean, when you're a coach and you want 110% out of your guys and it seemed like when, if you would have watched that, it seems like, where was that when I was the coach? Where was that team when I was a coach there? Even though there's differences and everything, like still your head coach, you know, you got to play for him. He's trying to coach you. He's trying to coach to a championship. So that was definitely interesting that they did that. Yeah, and Stephen A. Smith sounded off about it, and he called them classless. And, I mean, a couple other things he called them. He said it was a tone-deaf actions was his uh, actual saying about it. He said it was a bad look for the Bucks. So, I mean, like I said, it's not a good look if you are Milwaukee, but what can you do? What can you do? Move on from it. I think, you know, Doc Rivers coming in, the big thing I look at with Doc Rivers, he's not going to put up with crap. That's the big thing with Doc. That's my worry for Doc, too. If this team is really player-driven right now, or its players are in control, if Doc comes in and tells them this is how it's going to be, and they're like, ah, you know, Doc, we really don't think so, that's what has me worried, because then Doc might be on the fast way out, too. So it could be interesting, but definitely something to watch for there. Bucks and Cavs in action here coming up this weekend. With that, though, I just want to talk about your hometown team, Century 21 Gold Key Realty. Call Peggy, Sue, or Anna to find your dream home, or if you're looking to sell, find them on Facebook at Home Team Century 21 Gold Key Realty, or stop in and see them at their location in Marshfield. But with that, we got some action in the college men's basketball coming up this weekend here. We have Marquette in action on Saturday. They're going to be taking on Seton Hall. That should be a big matchup there. Seton Hall coming in 13-7, and seven, Marquette at 14-5. and five. Seton Hall has dropped a couple games as of late. Game to Creighton there in three overtimes, an impressive game there. And then a close loss to Providence. Marquette been getting back to winning ways as of late. Wins over Villanova, St. John's. And, you know, 86-73 to 73 over DePaul, closer than I thought it was going to be. DePaul had three wins on the season going into that one, and Marquette was not able to close them out. So definitely interesting there. So, Austin, what are we seeing for some of the key guys to watch out for in this matchup between Marquette and DePaul? Oh, uh, seeing Hall? Um, yeah. I mean, last time they played against Marquette, they beat Marquette 78-75. And Seton Hall was pretty much in control of that whole game until towards the end there. Marquette kind of made a little bit little bit of a run there. Uh, but like you said, they just dropped Creighton in uh, three overtimes and then Providence, which they also previously beat. In. And this could honestly be another case where they beat a team and then they play here at Marquette and they could possibly drop it here to Marquette. Marquette, I mean, like you said, DePaul, not a very good team. We didn't go over that game, I'm pretty sure. But, I mean, if you saw their record, you could see not not the most impressive. I mean, the best team – or the next worst team is probably Detroit Merce, who hasn't won a game all year. So, uh, DePaul was there pretty bad. But looking at their statistics, seeing all 13-7, second in the Big East there. And uh, 
They're led by Kaderi Richmond, uh, averaging 16.4 points per game, along with 4.9 assists per game and 2.2 steals per game. So he leads the team in all three of those categories. Alamir Dave or Alamir Dawes averages 14.8 points per game. Dre Davis averages 13.7 points per game. But the big guy, Jaden Bediaco, averages 7.7 rebounds per game and 1.9 blocks per game. So definitely has that big man factor along in there that could give Igudaro some troubles. I'm pretty sure the last time that Seton Hall played against Marquette, it was mainly Tyler Kolick that was struggling. This is kind of when Marquette was going through their struggles here. Tyler Kolick didn't really do a whole lot. And just looking at their box score again, Kolick had five points. So Igudaro didn't really have that trouble that we thought that he would with the big guy there. He still had 22 points. Joplin had 15, but Kolick only with five points and only one three-pointer made there. When you look at the Seton Hall Pirates, Richmond had 21, Dawes had 23. So those two guys that are at the top of their points per game. But besides that, they didn't really have a lot of help off the bench there. It was mainly those two guys, and then Davis had 11. So definitely could see another close game. But like I said, if Kolick puts up more than five points, then Marquette's may, most probably going to win this game um, more than more than not, and um, now they're ranked. Marquette's ranked for uh, fifteenth, I think. Fourteenth, we're ranked fourteenth. So they've def they've dropped since that, but the uh, seedings don't matter. We've talked about that before, and uh, now Seton Hall is going to have to try and prove to themselves. To win on the road here against Marquette, they got that they got that home win against Marquette, but it's when you have to go into the into the opponent's house and play them. That's when uh, things start to get a little dicey there, and uh, should be a good game again. I'd say Seen Hall definitely underrated. Yeah. They did drop they did drop those two games there against Creighton and Providence, but still a very good team here. And uh, those were two close close games too. I mean, they lost 97-94, 67-63. And like we've been saying, surprised they're not ranked, even though they lost those two games. And I mean, now we probably won't see them ranked because they're thirteen and seven, and the polls will probably keep FAU in there just for some reasons. But um, surprised they weren't ranked before those two losses. But I mean, if we see another Marquette loss here against Seton Hall, I'm surprised Seton Hall is not ranked in here. But Marquette definitely needs this win, especially how close it was against DePaul there. Um, some probably head scratching going on in Marquette's locker room. Yeah. And, you know, like you said, going in this one, they need to pick up the win here, especially at home at the Pfizer. You got to be able to take care of business on your home court here, especially in big East action. So should be a good game here. Seton Hall coming into this one. Like we were talking there, 13 and seven, but nothing to shake your head at. They've had a couple of close losses. They've been in a couple of good games here and they got that win over Marquette already. 78 uh, to 75. And we know now, Marquette knows what Seton Hall's got. Seton Hall knows what Marquette has. That's how you play this game now. So it's going to be definitely a big uh, rematch here between Seton Hall and Marquette coming up there on FS1 on Saturday at noon. That'll be a noon game for the Marquette Golden Eagles. But with that, I want to get into our next matchup. That one's actually coming up tonight here. And that will be the Badgers taking on Michigan State, number 13 Wisconsin coming in at 15 and 4, taking on 12 and 7 Michigan State at the Kohl Center, 7 o'clock tip. You know, it's exactly the same concept. Seton Hall versus Marquette, Michigan State and Wisconsin. Difference is Wisconsin went to East Lansing and won the first matchup. Now Michigan State's coming back to the Kohl Center. They've faced each other, but this is still a tough Michigan State team. So, Austin, who are we looking at for some of the main guys to watch out for here for Michigan State going into this game? Yeah, before I get into that, I'm looking at their schedule, and Michigan State's been playing pretty decent since the last time we saw them. They beat number six Baylor, so that's a pretty good game. Baylor's recently dropped from them. And then they had a few wins in between there, lost in Northwestern, but and lost Illinois only by three points. But I mean, they've won the last past three games that they played. So they're on a winning streak here going into Wisconsin. Looking at some of the statistics here, Tyson Walker leading their team in points per game and steals with 19.7 points and 1.9 steals. 
A.J. Hogard, 11.2 points per game and leading the team in assists with five. Malik Hall, 11.1 points per game, and then Jaden Atkins has 10.4. Matty Sissoku averages 6.6 rebounds, and then Carson Cooper, 0.9 blocks per game there. And uh, I don't know how this game's going to go. They average 76.2 points per game, uh, re- rebounds 36.1, and then 17.7 assists. 7.2 steals per game, Trage. Um, we've seen the struggles with the Badgers' offense on turning over the ball these past few games, Penn State, and their most recent one, Minnesota, especially early in the game. Uh, early in the game against Minnesota, they seemed like they were turning the ball over quite a bit. And so the 7.2 steals per game definitely could add a factor into that. Um, but overall, they have, they uh, shoot 36.2 from three-point range and only 70% from free throw. And we've seen, I mean, Minnesota weren't able to hit their free throws against the Badgers down at the stretch, and that came back to hurt them. So um, we know how good Wisconsin is at shooting their free throws, especially lately. That could, in these closed games, come back to haunt Michigan State. But I think this is a different team compared to when we played on the last time in Michigan State. They were ranked, I'm pretty sure, pretty high at the beginning of the year. And then they lost to, they lost to James Madison, and then, <laughs> and then they kind of just dropped from there. I mean, they lost to Duke also and, and Arizona, and then they lost to Wisconsin. So, um, But like I said, they're on a recent winning streak here going into Wisconsin. And um, I think Wisconsin' main keys is don't turn the ball over and um, utilize your players that you've been using these past few games like um oh my gosh max klesman can't believe i almost forgot his name max klesman's been on a roll only scored 11 yep. i'm pretty sure against minnesota but huge 11 points just seen him produce tyler wall stephen crowl aj store let's just kind of get back onto wisconsin tracks and have a whole team effort here i think uh that'll be huge checky hepburn I mean, it'd be nice if he scored a couple points, but I mean, if he has a lot of assists, just or a court general, that's good. That's good enough for me. And uh, let's just continue our winning ways. Yeah, you know, like you said, looking at this team, Tyson Walker, you got to contain Tyson Walker. He's the main scorer off this team. Like you were talking there, 19.7 points per game. You got to control Tyson Walker. You have to run him off the three point line. He's a 40% three point shooter on the season, he's about 47% from the field. All around impressive point guard for this Michigan State Spartans team. We got to remember, Tom Izzo is the head coach of the Spartans. He is always right there. He is the leader of the pack, the fighting Izzo, as they call him. We got to watch out because this Michigan State team's well coached. And coming into a game in the Cole Center, they will definitely be ready for the battle. A couple of the guys to watch out for in this game that haven't really gotten the recognition this year just because they've been struggling to start this year, A.J. Hogard and Jaden Atkins. Now, if you remember last year, that deep March Madness run they made, Atkins and Hogard were big keys in that run. So you got to watch out for those two. You know, they're shooting. Both of them are at 30% from downtown on the season right now. Atkins is at about 36. But you have to control them out there. Don't let them get hot. Tyson Walker is going to hit shots. You can't let Hogard and Atkins beat you too because if you let this guard play for Michigan State get all over you, those three get hot, all of them collectively, this is going to be a long night at the Cole Center for the Badgers. So tough defense, definitely going to be needed in this one. Also a guy in Trey Holloman coming off the bench there. He's played 20 minutes a game, averaging about six points, but he's 44% from downtown. So if he puts it up, it's about a 50-50 shot. It's going to go down. So Holloman's a guy to watch out for there. Don't let the role players for Michigan State upset you in this one. I think that's going to be a big thing to watch out for if you are the Badgers. Our bench has got to beat their bench. Blackwell, McGee, Asesian, whoever it is, if they get into this game, they have to be able to put up buckets in this game here. Put up a score against this Michigan State defense because Michigan State's bench is going to do the same against you. Malik Hall, he's been a mainstay in this uh, Michigan State lineup for a long time now, averaging about 25 minutes a game, 11 points, 30% from downtown. Malik Hall is still a threat on the offensive end. Don't let that 30% from downtown fool you. He can still ring it up. So the thing in this game, don't let Michigan State beat you from the three-point line. 
That's what you got to watch out for in this one. They aren't collectively a great three-point shooting team, but I've seen these guys. Everybody's seen these guys play, and we know they can ring it up. We know they can shoot it from out there. Don't let them prove it in this game against the Badgers. Make them put it on the deck. Make them drive into traffic or into another defender, into a trap, whatever you have set up there on the defensive end. Make them do the work and make them have to earn every bucket in this game. The most physical, you know, Badgers, Michigan State, Big Ten basketball at the Kohl Center. This game is going to come down to who's more physical. Who is going to be more physical? Is it going to be Wisconsin at home coming out of the gates? Or is this Michigan State team going to jump on the Badgers? That's going to be a thing I want to watch out for in this one is how do the Badgers respond to Michigan State? We know Tom Izzo has these guys coached up right. We know they're going to come out hot and heavy. How does the Badgers respond to that? How do they come out, you know, can are they going to match it? Are they going to take it a step further? They have to be the aggressor in this game. I thought the Badgers have gotten away from that. They've gotten in, they've gotten into winning ways and they've gotten away from being the aggressors in games. They used to be the hunter, right? They went into play Marquette. They were the hunter in that game. They went to Arizona. They were the hunter. Technically on the road in East Lansing against Michigan State, they were the hunter in that game. Now you're hunted. You're one of the top teams in the Big Ten now. You're one of the top teams in the country. You're top 15 in the country right now on the cusp of being in the top 10. You are hunted now by the rest of the league. What are you going to do to that? Are you going to lay over and just, you know, kind of play these games out? Or are you going to come out and be the aggressor night in and night out? That's how championship teams are built is how you respond. They responded well, I thought. In that Minnesota game, it turned into a barn burner at the barn. The Badgers responded and became the aggressors in that game. And I think that's what they have to continue moving forward here is being the aggressors and not just at the end of a game, all game long. Like you said, put together a full 40 minutes in this one where you are the aggressor from the opening tip until the final whistle blows. I want to see this Badger team put it all together here, especially against a pesky Michigan State team coming to the Cole Center there for a Friday night matchup. There is nothing better than the Cole Center on a Friday night. It's going to be packed. I know it's sold out. There's got to be, you know, the Badgers have to use that to their advantage and drive them to a victory here against Michigan State because this could set them apart. This game could be the difference between the Badgers in a high seed in the NCAA tournament or sitting down there at eight, nine seed. This could be the game that decides that kind of thing because you're going to get, you're getting into the meat of conference play now. You know, you played your beginning half of the Big Ten schedule, but you haven't faced Purdue yet. You haven't faced Illinois yet. You have a lot of teams left on the docket that you have to face yet that are tough, and you got to face them on the road. So this game at home, you got to take care of, like we talked about with that Marquette game, home cooking, right? You got to take care of your business at home. Going on the road and winning in the Big Ten, that's, I mean, not really heard of. But winning at home, that's where you got to take care of your business. In this one, they got to take care of it. I'm looking at this game. For the Badgers to win, we have to see a good game out of Chucky Hepburn. I think Chucky Hepburn has to be able to produce in this game for the Badgers. I really do. This is a good Michigan State team. Don't let that record fool you. I know a lot of people think Michigan State basketball is down and out. They think Tom Izzo's not with the trends these days and everything in between. Michigan State basketball is fine. They're still there. This is a well-put-together team once they get all the fine fine tuning done and get ready to rock and roll, right? It's a slow start, but I don't believe Michigan State's down and out. This is a tough game for the Badgers. It will be a tough game. It's going to be a hard-fought game, and I think Chucky Hepburn, not just on the offensive end, Chucky Hepburn is going to be instrumental on the defensive end against Tyson Walker. Can he slow down Tyson Walker? That's going to be a big thing to watch out for in this one. I'm looking at the guards in general. You have to have good guard play in this one on the defensive end, watching out there for Atkins and Hogard along with uh, Tyson Walker. We're going to have to have good guard play in this one. Connor Asesian or if it's McGee coming off the bench, whoever it is coming into this game is going to have to play tough, hard-nosed defense and physical in this game against Michigan State. And I'm also looking at Tyler Wall. How does Tyler Wall, after that game at Minnesota, played well, How does he come back in this game? I want to see a good performance out of Tyler Wall in this one, along with Chucky Hepburn and the guards for the Badgers here. I think they will be instrumental, Tyler Wall especially, because he's going to end up in a situation where he's on Hogard or he's on Atkins. 
I want to see what Tyler Wall can do defensively against some pretty good guard play here for Michigan State. So, Austin, who are you seeing right now for some guys who you think got to have big games for the Badgers here to pull up a win against Michigan State? Yeah. The last time the Badgers played against Michigan State, they beat them 70-57 to in Michigan State. Now, A.J. Storr had 22 points, Stephen Crowell 18 points, and John Blackwell was the next leading scorer with 10 off the bench. And I'm pretty sure, Trey, I don't know if you remember this, but this is kind of when I was going on my rant saying, why don't we start John Blackwell over Max Klesman? Because Max Klesman scored two points in that game there in 30 minutes. So almost the whole game there. He he led the – except for Hepburn, he led the whole team in minutes and crowd. But um, for only scoring two points, I was like – I was kind of pissed off. I'm like – Put Blackwell in there. Start Blackwell. He's uh, scoring more points, playing better defense. And now it's kind of came back to bite me in the butt, Trage, because Max Klesman is going insane. And, hey, it's um, me and Jordan Love, man. It's me and Jordan Love. I've been <laughs> you know, there. I've been there. Yeah. You got Jordan Love. I got Max Klesman. Yeah. But we've been there. We've been there. And uh, so I think Stephen Crowell is still going to have to need a big game out of here. He scored 18 points, like I said last time. I don't know if he's going to score that amount, that same amount. It seems like he hasn't been scoring the same amount of points early in this se- early in the season compared to now. And same with AJ Store. It seems like our offense. I don't know for some reason, but it seems like our offense is a little bit different compared to at the beginning of the year to now. And that could be because Max Klesman starting to score the ball a little bit more. I think Max Klesman is once again. I think Michigan State. First off, I think Michigan State is probably going to try and key in on. Max Klesman, but they still have to have be in the back of their mind that AJ score or AJ Store scored twenty two points against them the first time, and I think that's just something that makes Wisconsin's offense deadly. I think AJ Store will have another big game, but also Max Klesman will continue his reign on the Big Ten and uh, try and get a little bit more recognition than he's been deserving. I feel like. I mean, he had he had some recognition after that twenty four point game or whatever it was against Indiana, but it seems like I don't know. People just don't really seem to care about him a whole lot. It's always Purdue. What does Purdue have? Well, Wisconsin has some pretty good players over here, and even though Max Klesman only scored two points in the first time Michigan State played against him, I think he's gained a lot more confidence, and I think he'll add even a little bit more factor into that. Um, like you said, John Blackwell scored 10 points the first time. Still going to be crucial for him to play some solid bench minutes, along with Connor Seijan. Seeing those two in there, um, going to need some decent scoring out of them. But overall, I mean, stripe. Hey, I'm pretty sure it's a it's a stripe game. I think uh, white white and red out. I don't know. However, they do that quarter when in the seats there where sections are checkered or whatever. So. Pretty sure the place is going to be sold out here. No one really has anything else going on on a Saturday afternoon or Friday after Friday night um, than to watch this Wisconsin play against Michigan State. And uh, should be packed there. And hopefully it's an electric atmosphere and Wisconsin comes out with a huge win over Michigan State. Definitely a big matchup for the Badgers coming up there. Like we said, tonight coming up 7 o'clock from the Cole Center there. That game will also be on FS1. So some big, big network for this Badger-Michigan State matchup. Hopefully we get Jeff Levering. I think uh, he's been doing a lot of work with the FS1, so maybe Jeff Levering will be on the call there for the Badgers. Got to love Jeff. Big Trage, as long as Joe Buck sticks to football, I'm happy. This is true. This is true. My biggest fear is that I'm going to tune into the national championship when the Badgers finally make it. Joe and Buck and Troy it's Aikman. going to be Joe Buck and Troy Aikman calling it. The Hall of from... Famer, Troy Aikman. Oh, man. You ever realize, Trage, I getting off topic off. here, getting off topic. Have you ever realized um, whenever Joe Buck introduces Troy Aikman as his partner, he, he always says the Hall of Famer, Troy Aikman. He never just yeah, says nobody. Troy Aikman as if everyone already knows he's a Hall of Famer. He has to, he has to point him out that he's a Hall of Famer. He's the most epic wingman you could ever ask for. Like, you walk into a bar, they see some pretty lady across there. He's like, hey, have you met my friend? What if he just said Troy? They'd be like, who cares? But they're like, have you met my friend, the Hall of Famer, Hall of Famer Troy. Troy Aikman? They're like, oh, hello. Nice to meet you. Let me buy you a drink. 
See? I'd be like, yeah. you can buy me a drink, buddy. You've made so much money in your life. Now well, that you're a Hall of Famer. That's why they're not coming up to you. That's why they're not coming up to you and talking to you. They're coming up to other people and talking to them. <laughs> yeah, true. But I don't know. True that. Anyway, off topic. But, yeah, Dog don't want to see it's them okay. in the national championship. Um, Let's just stick to Jim Nance. Does he still do uh, – no, sure I think was... he's done now. I thought oh, he was thought done he's... now. Yeah, he could be done now. I thought la... oh, last I thought year might have been done. his last year, huh? Last year was his last year when he called that game. It was his last one. Man, he's a legend. Because he always – he was – what was his catchphrase? Welcome, friends, or hello, my friends? That that was in the that, – that's for uh, Augusta Masters. I know, but I'm pretty sure he said it at the national – whatever. I think he said it at the end of the national championship or something. So that it was like his final sign-off. It was his final well, sign-off friends. there. Yeah, I think that was, that was it. I Probably really not. do. I think Jim Nad's done. So I don't know who's calling the national championship now. I really don't. I have no idea who's going to do it. If you could find it for me, that'd be A-OK. We could figure it out. But – with that, I want to move on here. Like I said, Michigan State, Wisconsin coming up tonight at 7 o'clock. But with that, I want to talk about Pittsville Farm and Home Center. At the store, they serve you anything from hydraulic hoses to red roses. Stop in and see them and the awesome crew down there at Pittsville Farm and Home Center in Pittsville. I just wanted to mention Wisconsin women's. They will be in action on Saturday at 2 o'clock, taking on Rutgers. We also have Marquette. Women in action against Butler. That'll be coming up Saturday at 4. Green Bay facing Wright State on Saturday at 1. And Milwaukee will get Wright State right before that. Right before that for Wright State. Right before that on Friday. Tonight they will be taking on Wright State there at 7 o'clock on ESPN+. Plus. So a big weekend in college hoops for the men and women all in action this weekend. You know, Trey, I wouldn't be surprised if Brian Anderson actually takes his spot. Because Brian Anderson, he's been he's been always that would be awesome. Because he's always there for he always did the Brewers. I'm pretty sure, right? He's does he still do the Brewers? Spotty, he's got like 50 games that he does with the Brewers nowadays. And then sometimes Matt Lupe's in there, and then some other guys. Not anymore. Matt said no to it anymore. Jeff does it now. Jeff he was always good. Does the Brewers? Yeah. So, uh, I mean, there's just a list of guys that are like. Kind of crews that do it, and Brian Anderson is kind of the next guy if Jim Nance doesn't do it. Because I'm sure Grant Hill, Grant Hill is the one who was it Grant Hill that works with Jim uh, Nance, no, Bill he, Rafferty, Grant Hill, and Tracy Wolfson. Wolfson yes. is the sideline reporter, and I'm pretty sure Brian Anderson works with Grant Hill every once in a while. They call games together, so I wonder Probably. if they'll just slide in Brian Anderson there with Grant On Hill TNT, and uh, Raftery. Yeah. Yep, I'm pretty darn sure of it now. So maybe they have Brian, because I know Brian Anderson used to call a lot of the March Madness games leading up to the national championship. I wonder if maybe they'll have him slide in there for Jim Nance now as the main uh, broadcaster for the national championship. Well, and there's Kevin Harlan, too, who's been doing it for forever, it seems like, also. Some pretty big names, honestly, if you've ever seen yeah, or ever watched. Cool. Yeah. So should be interesting. <sighs> But Jim Nance will be missed. On that list. What'd you say? Joe Buck better Joe Buck better not be on that. I did not see Joe Buck. Candidate. Joe Buck, he's on ESPN now. So luckily ESPN does not who knows? He could be covering the NIT tournament and hopefully the Buck or the Badgers are not in that again this year. So <laughs> Can you imagine the pay I you you'd have to get docked in pay to be the we're live from the NIT national championship. This is Joy Buck with Hall of Famer. Troy Aikman. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, if anyone doesn't already watch off. those, no one would watch them. I'd shut the TV off. I'd be like, yeah, that's enough of that. We're going to bed. All right, <laughs> so <laughs> we're going to bed. So with that, I want to talk about game day supply in Alaska. Do you have a sports club or team? Are you looking for some sweet custom uniforms or apparel? Check out the awesome crew at Game Day Supply to help your team get the sweetest gear. Find them on Facebook at Game Day Supply or online at gamedaysupply.net. Austin's back. Rogan took his job yesterday, but he's back. He wants his job back. Austin, what do we got for a fact of the day? Yeah, my fact of the day is on this day in 1963, the Major League Rules Committee votes to expand the strike zone. And I found this interesting. Why would you expand the strike zone 
if every strike zone is different compared to the, uh, depending on the player. I just thought maybe they just weren't throwing enough strikes or umps were being a little bit too tight there. And now trades were looking at robots calling strikes. So uh, I don't know what's going on with the Major League Baseball Rules Committee, but I just thought that was interesting back in 1963. I'm guessing that the strike zone was, yeah, like you said, terrible. It was, the strike zone is expanded on the lower end, moving from the top of the knees to the to the bottom of the knees in 1996. Is that when you oh, said? Because you couldn't tell that much from a 90-something mile an hour pitch where it lands at the top of the knees or the Did bottom Did you say of the 1996? Knees. Right? You said 1996, right? 1963. Oh, see, 1996, they moved it from the top of the knee to the bottom of the knee. I wonder what the – I want to see once. It was probably the from the belly to the chest. The, top of the, the strike zone from 1963 to 1968, the strike zone went from the top of the batter's shoulders to the knees. From 1950 until 1962, the strike zone went from the batter's armpits to the top of – that's kind of what we I, see right now, ain't it? Wait, but, okay, I don't understand. Okay, so. So they expanded it. Then the, then the pre- then. From, 1960, from 1950 to 1962, the strike zone went from the batter's armpits to the top of the knees. But in 1963, they changed it from the top of the batter's shoulders to the knees. You moved it like a centimeter. I don't even know, like, realistically, if you actually moved it. Like, how is that? Like you said, I mean, if, I mean back in the day, it was Depends on how big nine, some one's shoulders are, Trage, I guess. I guess so, like Barry Bond's shoulders compared to Craig Council, but, I mean. Jose Canseco's shoulders, pretty big. He was on steroids. I mean, but, like, you Okay, I guess you barely moved it, but that's cool. We made a big old news story about it for absolutely no reason. There's a glossary about the strike zone. The version (laughs) of the strike zone from 1963 was also utilized prior to 1950, going back to the late 1800s. Wow. So... From 1988 till 1995, the strike zone went from the midpoint between the shoulders and the top of the uniform pants to the top of the knees. Interesting. Yeah, Trage, this is just... Now I can see why umpiring is just not the job for me. You know, I, I, I umpire, I've umpired some uh, middle school uh, little league games before. And I got I got kids down there calling some calling me some BS words, saying you know that's some bull bull crap calls. I'm like, dude, you're you're in little league. You're not going to the league. I'm sorry, buddy. All right, you're, you're not nine going years to old. Shut up. Shut up. And swing the bat. You missed the first two balls that you tried swinging at. You suck. All right. I'm not gonna tell you that to your face, but don't don't come yelling at uh old Austin Humkey here if you can't swing the bat and hit the ball at least the first two times. And I ring you up on the third one. Yeah. <laughs> the ball might have been in the dirt, but I got places I got to be. So I don't really care how your feelings are. And then dad in the back yelling, dad in the back yelling, that was a bullet, bullet, BS call. Dad, all right, once again, little league, your kid's not going to the major leagues. Shut your mouth, get a hot dog, eat it, all right? <laughs> I tell you, I agree. I agree. I've re- I've umped a couple of games. I've refed a couple of games too in basketball, and you get the heckling from the crowd. It's like, hey. You all don't want to be here. I don't want to be here. This is fifth grade basketball. I mean, what are we really doing here? What are we doing? No trade. It's for the community. It's for the community. Exactly. We're doing a nice thing, a community service, and they still want to yell at us. You know, that's just how today is, Strange. Hey, it's made me learn not to yell. Hey, it's made me learn, though. I don't yell at refs a whole lot more now. That ref, like. And there is a shortage, especially in Wisconsin. There's a refing shortage for high school. So, um, because they get any of y'all are listening to this podcast and think about refing, there's the shortage. So, uh, definitely take that advantage and help out your local communities. But people, are I understand why people days. don't want to. What'd you say? 
people are soft. They don't like being called names when they're on the court roughing. <laughs> well, a lot of, a lot of us true. out there that's are on true. the verge it's of rough. death. So, yeah, yeah, it's kind of cruel what some fans will do to refs. But, but with that, enough of the roughing. Enough of the roughing. We got one more topic. We got the NFC and AFC championship games coming up this weekend here. A trip to the Super Bowl on the line. We got to predict them. So we got the Chiefs and the Ravens. Big matchup from Baltimore. We got Rogan is going to take, he he did his picks. He still sent us his picks. So Rogan is going to take the Ravens to win that game against the Chiefs. I'm going to take, I just don't think he can do it. Give me Patrick Mahomes and the Chiefs. It's in Baltimore. It's going to be tough, but it's Patty Mahomes. And I think that offense is slowly starting to figure it out, and they got a pretty good defense. Give me the Chiefs in a – I think it's going to be a 24-21 game, something close. Trage, I saw something on Instagram that the past – I don't know. However long Josh Allen has been in the league and he's made the playoffs, whoever has beat him – and went on to the next round, they lost that game the next round. Oh. So I'm going to go with the Ravens. If that prophecy is true, the Ravens should win, and uh, that's who I'm going to pick for this next game, or for this game. So we, are t- so we got two picks for the Ravens. Rogan and Austin taking the Ravens. I'm taking the Chiefs. Next up, the 630 game on Fox. Lions 49ers. That's going to be a big matchup there. I oh that's gonna be a tough game for the 49ers at home. Give me I think the Lions are gonna pull it off. I really do. Give me the Lions winning that game. I got the Lions taking care of business there. Rogan is also taking the Lions in that game against the 49ers. Oh, man, this one plays with my emotions a little bit because the Lions, they have they've been through so much this year, Trades. They've been through that Detroit, Detroit, the city has been through so much, Trage, since 1990, whatever. And, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. And I want them to win. I want them to win. And, I mean, 49ers did not look good against a Packers defense. And the Lions defense is, I'd say, a little bit better than the Packers defense. But, man, I want, I want to go Lions, but I might go 49ers here, Trage. I'm going to go with the 49ers. The 49ers. Austin's taking the 49ers. So I have the Chiefs and Lions in my Super Bowl. Rogan's got the Ravens and Lions, and you have the Ravens and 49ers. You went with the color scheme. A lot no, of people I didn't. going with the color scheme. You went with the color scheme. I was going to bring it up, Trey. I was going to bring up the color scheme, but I'm like, you know, this is how I feel, man. I I want the hey hey I am going for the lines I'm cheering for the lines I, okay. I I will point that out okay okay I'll give it to you so with that we got to get our sports story of the day I almost forgot about it what do you got for me for your sports story of the day Austin day off yesterday a lot of things happened what do you got today yeah my sports story of the day kind of interesting one actually uh, yesterday as in Thursday was the first ever game in Pro Volleyball Federation history. It was the debut between uh, debut match between the Atlanta Vibe and Omaha Supernovas and drew in 11,624 fans in Omaha, Nebraska. And uh, it is, the caption just says on Instagram, professional volleyball just got even better. So, I mean, this is kind of huge because – I feel like, I mean, yes, there's the WNBA and the NWSL, and that's kind of it for women's soccer. There's not, I mean, there's the MLB for baseball. There's not really a softball professional league. And, I mean, softball's kind of been on the rise, same as volleyball, but I feel like volleyball kind of just spiked these past few years for viewership. And now there's like that a boy. Oh, actually. (laughs) Playing with the words. Oh, not intended, but uh, go me. And, um, (laughs) <laughs> I don't but, get that audio. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, But now there's a professional volleyball league, and they just debuted. And getting 11,000 fans for your first game ever, uh, definitely good for them. Because a lot of 
uh, college volleyball players, when they get done with their college career, they'll go overseas because I'm pretty sure, oh, man, in the – I there's some – there's some uh, European countries that have professional leagues over there that are pretty good, but now Wisconsin or not Wisconsin, but the United States is getting on that trend, and I think it's good for, I think it's good for volleyball because volleyball is definitely, like I said, on the upward trend there, and uh, definitely, definitely something new and probably something new to, new to sports. So good for them. I'd be excited for a professional softball league. I think that'd be cool. I think that'd be cool to watch a professional softball league in some way. Like you said there, they really don't have it yet. They have the Olympics and they have little things like that, but or not little things like the Olympics, but little things with softball along the way. But it definitely would be interesting to see something like that. I agree. Volleyball has been on the rise there and it's cool to see that they're getting a professional league out there for volleyball. Probably a little bit easier to put together a professional league for volleyball than softball just because you'd have to probably build stadiums and stuff like that for yeah. softball to be able to get them in. Maybe you could utilize college stadiums just because some of them are empty at times. Maybe professional softball team could utilize it that way. That'd be something interesting to see there, but definitely a step up there for the women's game on that side of sports. Definitely interesting right there. I don't have something that interesting for my sports story. I just had the NBA all-stars being announced, uh, Giannis Antetokounmpo will head the East team and LeBron James will head the West. Once again, I, it's the same two every year. I don't know every why year. we still do this every year. Damian I don't Lillard know why we still do this for the Bucks. Yeah, I saw that. And they're going to have Tyrese Halliburton, Jason Tatum, and uh, Joel Embiid will be on the East. Uh, Luka Doncic, uh, Shai Gilgis Alexander, Kevin Durant, uh, Jokic, those guys all headed for the West there along with LeBron. You know, I think there's other guys in the league right now that could have got the nod over some of these other guys for the starters in the All-Star game. But, you know, it's fan favorites and, you know, league favorites. So that's technically how it rolls out there. Are they still playing for a charity there? Because I remember a few years back when Giannis and LeBron were still the captains, but they picked their teams, and then the winner um, had a certain amount of money. They played, like, first to 150 or something. I don't know what it was. That and was then, for um, the first Kobe Bryant trophy. That's what that was. I think that's what you're thinking of right now is when they played. It was right after Kobe's passing, and they played uh, to 100. And, they played uh, the equivalent of something and something else. I remember what you're talking about now. I remember what you're talking about now is they played to a certain number and they had to get there and they, you know, I, I yes, well, and yes, Anthony I, Davis won on a free throw or something. Yep. Yep. That was the first one after Kobe passed. And I'm pretty sure they have the MVP award is now named after Kobe Bryant. So I'm pretty sure everybody was fighting for that first award there. Kind of like the yeah. in season tournament, everybody fighting for that banner. They wanted to hang a banner. I think we should get a banner. We should get a banner. When we, when we get a studio to shoot the podcast in, we're going to get a banner and we're going to hang it. We're going to we're gonna have a banner, ceremony. Coach. What are we going to do? What are we going to put on the banner? I don't know. Like uh, the, we're going to get banners for, um, let's see. We're, we're going to really do um, anything. best catchphrase. Um, whoever on the show comes up with the best catchphrase. Um, we we could just make random random banners. I mean, we got a, a the Lakers hung a banner for the in season tournament champion in their stadium. True. You don't think we can make up a random banner to hang up somewhere? Wait, I got yeah, put on a flagpole outside. I mean, Reso we're do resources it. are a little short now, Trage, but I think I think we could come up with something. We'll draw it up on a piece of paper or something and hang it from the wall. It's basically the same standpoint. Use some two sided tape and stick it to the wall. Good some enough. Two-sided tape. I got some fishing line outside. We'll hang it with fishing line from the roof. We'll hang That's it some Wisconsin line. type thing right there. That's what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying right there. So with that, anything else we got to cover here leading up into the weekend? No, I thought we've covered pretty much everything for the sports in Wisconsin this weekend. Um, we got a lot coming no, up this weekend. No Packers trade. That's sad, but. And I think it's good that we didn't talk about him today, honestly, because I feel like we talked about him for the past how many weeks now and uh, how many days. And it was, it was honestly, it was a little refresher that we didn't have to talk about him just once. 
I'm not going to talk about him on Monday. We'll talk about him on Monday. We'll you know, well, Monday. my head will be cleared. There you go. A weekend of relaxation, not having to worry about the Packers. Sit back, so, have a cup of Joe, and enjoy the weekend, everybody. Exactly. Just like Austin said, sit back, enjoy the weekend there. If you weren't listening yesterday, get some Netflix and chill socks. Put them on, relax on the couch. <laughs> oh, the God. That's all I got to say. So, so with that, this has been Wisconsin Sports on the Go with Trades. Thank you guys for listening. We hope you have a fantastic weekend. And until we catch you guys back here on Monday, Deuces.